Hello, everyone. Welcome to another special edition of the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program Teacher Certification Course. Uh, my name is William, and uh, if you're joining us live on Facebook, if you're here at the Peaceful Sol Solution Headquarters in Abilene, Texas, please take a seat. We're going to be uh, continuing where we left off in the Respect Unit, the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program Respect Unit. We're going to be on page, uh, we're going to be on page 85. We're going to be starting chapter 4, but we're going to have to be rehearsing some things first before we get into that. Um, today we had our special uh, one-day event, our spring conference, uh, Peaceful Solution Spring Conference. We had a really, really, really great turnout. We had a really, really great time. We got to see uh, the Peaceful Solution, uh, the progress of the Peaceful Solution all over the world that's taking place at this time. Uh, and w there's a lot going on, okay? There's a lot of people that are getting involved. This, uh, this, uh, uh, this peace train is continuing to roll, okay? And I would suggest that you jump on board, okay? Do whatever you can. As I told you last class, I ended off talking about the importance of getting involved in the peaceful solution in, in whatever capacity you can. You know, you don't have to be a certified teacher to teach the program to your children, you know, to talk about it with your friends. You know, you can, uh, uh, and, and, to, and to also you don't have to be certified to practice it, you know. You, you can, uh, that's how you become certified, practicing, learning, you know, coming here and getting the training, and, and, you know, you can become certified. That's what this class is about. It's a certification course. So, again, I left off on uh, LP4C. Uh, I made it that far last time. Lesson Plan, Respect, and Society. I'm in Chapter 4. Uh, it's the pages right before page 85 in your teacher's manual. By the way, if you're joining us online, you can you can go ahead and go to the Facebook page drop-down menu, the official official Peaceful Solution page. There's a drop-down menu with all the manuals on it. We're on the Respect Unit. You can go ahead and download it and join us. So, um, as you recall, I did leave off in the note to the student. And remember, don't ever skip the note to the student if you're teaching this program. You know, when you're preparing for your lessons, always go over the note to the student so you can prepare yourself, you know, you can get all the information you can about, or I'm sorry, not the note to the student, but the note to the teacher, so you can get all the information you need, you know, to find out, well, what is it that I'm trying to get across to my students? You know, what's the purpose? Well, what's the goal, you know, that I, want to, that I want to achieve in this particular chapter? And we did go over that, so I'm going to go over to page LP4C, the Lesson Plan for Respect and Society, and at the top of the page, the purpose of an objective of this particular lesson is that students will learn that respect is necessary on a societal level. Students will also learn that a lack of respect adversely affects society. And we'll get into some of those definitions. We'll remind ourselves what society is, etc. Um, but the materials you're going to need for this particular lesson is your student handbooks. And the procedure one says, review the previous lesson, respect others by asking students the following questions. And because remember, the, the, when you're going into a new chapter, you're always going to have to, there's going to be review questions to remind the students what they went over. Because remember, there's a lot of information in that previous chapter, uh, and it might be a few days before you even get to the next lesson. And how much, how much information do we remember after one day? Or even the same day after you get a lesson, how much do you remember in uh, five hours from now, you know? You, you, you don't retain a lot, you know, you retain some, some, some basic things, points that really stick out to you, but always, always go over these things. It's very important. It's part of the recipe for success in the peaceful solution. So it says, how can you show appreciation and respect for all, all people? That's the question. And um, 
The answers will vary, but might include there's basic rules that apply to all people. They are avoid violent verbal or physical behavior, interact with consideration and compassion, remember compassion, caring about the needs of others, and accept that people are unique and have different beliefs and values. Remember, no, no one's the same. We're all from different cultures, as we saw today in the one-day event. We got people from all over the globe, and the cultural differences are astounding. You know, if you know, I'm, you know, Chris has given stories. Myself, Katan, David. We've talked about different places we've gone, and things are different in other places. And you need to, before you go visit any country, you should always study that country first. You know, especially if you're bringing an electrical plug, <laughs> make sure they use the same adapters. Um, you know, I mean, there's lots of differences, you know. And what might be considered respectful in this culture could be considered disrespectful in other places. And I'm talking about certain mannerisms, you know, certain things that we do uh, in front of people. In fact, when we had a peace conference here back in 2001, February of 2001, here at the Peaceful Solution Headquarters, um, we had to go through etiquette classes to learn how to deal with all the different dignitaries that were coming from all over the world and how to, you know, we had to learn everything basically over all over again, you know, about how to use a fork and a knife, how to speak, certain gestures not to use, etc. So it does pay off to do that because it shows the other person that you care enough to study about, you know, it shows that you, you cared enough to look into their culture, their customs and habits, you know, and treat them with the care and concern that you would want to be treated with if they came to your country. Okay, so um, then it also says, uh, well, I got another way that you can, can you put up the first slide there? Um, let's go to the second slide, actually, because that's a review question there. Let's go to the second slide. Second slide, there you go. Okay, so another way that we can show appreciation and value for all people is get to know other people. Get to know others. And uh, I'm going to read some of this here. It says, in order to build positive relationships and be respectful toward others, you must be aware of their needs and feelings. For example, some people talk to each other in a loud tone of voice. Others may not enjoy being spoken to in a manner, in that manner. To be respectful to both, you will need to adjust your tone of voice. In other words, what one person may think is disrespectful, another might think it's okay. Become familiar with the people you interact with. Remember I told you I have kind of a loud voice and some people don't like, you know, they think that I'm uh, angry or they think that I'm raising my voice at them or that I'm irritated or frustrated, and that's not the case. I just speak loudly, but I have to make adjustments, adjustments at times so I don't offend somebody. And that's what this is talking about. Let's put that back up. We'll go ahead and continue to read. It says, become familiar with the people you interact with. Get to know and care about them. If you see that there are certain things that they dislike, then avoid doing those things in their presence. You know, even if it's something that's not necessarily against the peaceful solution, you don't need to do it if it annoys somebody, okay? In other words, if it's something that annoys, you know, the way, you know, you're talking or the way uh, certain gestures you might make or certain words you might use or whatever, you know, if it's not breaking any rules in the peaceful solution, then there's nothing wrong with compromising, is there? The only time we don't compromise with somebody is if it breaks a moral, a moral rule, right? A moral character trait. If it's immoral, we do not, we do not uh, at all, in any way, shape, or form, compromise with it. Okay, so let's go ahead and put that back up. It says, um, for example, your sister doesn't like it when you whistle. To be respectful to her, you would refrain from whistling while she's in the same room with you. A respectful person is willing to go the extra mile in order to be courteous and caring to everyone. The important thing to remember is that becoming respectful takes time and commitment on your part and on the part of others. Remember what we talked about in the last class? Bringing peace to the world 
This is part of bringing peace to the world, what you're reading right there. You know, because peace begins with us in our own environment, you know, in our own home, in our own workplace, in our own school. It begins with us and how we treat other people. That's how peace is going to ripple out. It's going to ripple out from how we treat and being considerate to other people. And they're going to see our example. And they, in turn, might also start treating people with the same care, consideration, and respect that you want to be, that, that they want to be treated with. It's a ripple effect. Let's go ahead and put that slide back up one more time there. It says, the important thing to remember is that becoming respectful takes time and commitment on your part and the part of others. Each person must be willing to care about the feelings and needs of other people. Okay, so we have to be caring about other people's needs. Being, you know, considering one another, considering someone's feelings, okay? And, and I know, uh, I'm sure you all can uh, uh, relate to that. I'm sure there's certain people in your life that will tell you, hey, I don't like it when you do that. I don't like it when you talk to me that way. Or I don't like, I don't like how you look at me the way you do. Or whatever it might be. You know, make the adjustment. You know, it's okay. Okay, and then B, on the procedure in B, I'm on L page, LP, sorry, a lesson plan page uh, 4C. And I'm in uh, procedure B. It says, in what two ways can you show respect for others? And can you go back to that second slide that I had? The second, I think it was the first slide, actually. Because I, I want them to see the visual of the lesson where the, the, the procedures were going over. So B says, in what two ways can you show respect for others? And the answers will vary, but might include accepting the differences of others, and using a proper tone of voice are two ways respect can be shown to others. You know, in other words, you know, if you're dealing with your teacher and they ask you to do something, you don't raise your voice to them when you, when you reply to them, okay? You, you, use, you keep the level, you keep the tone respectful, okay? Same thing with parents, you know. You should show, or teachers should show the same respect to the students that we expect them to show us. It's not a one-way street, you know. We need to talk to the students, you know, the way we would want to be spoken to, okay? Now, does that mean that sometimes you won't have to raise your voice a little bit to get students' attention that are really rambunctious and they're not really paying attention? Yeah, sometimes you do need to raise your voice. But we don't have to do it, you know, just, just to be... Uh, exercising you know our authority over somebody or you know making them because we have power or control that they don't have okay so um, let's go to step two on lesson plan 4c page C it says uh, tell students that in the previous chapters they learn that respect applies to themselves and others in this chapter, they will explore the benefits of respect on a societal level. They will also learn that a lack of respect in the form of violence, crime, and racism affects society in negative ways. Have students read the introduction found on page 85 and guide class discussion by asking the students the following questions. How would you define the word society and what is culture and how does it relate to society? And it, then it goes on to, to explain to students that culture is what makes up one, makes one society different from the next and that there are many different values, beliefs, and customs that make up any given culture. So go ahead and turn, let's go ahead and go ahead and turn to page 85. And if you could put up that slide, my last visual for uh, the day. Um, it says at the top of page 85, it says, Society is made up of individuals. Therefore, if individuals value respect, society will also value respect. Do you remember what we learned in the character unit about positive peer pressure? You remember that? Positive peer pressure. There, it's not just negative, you know. It's not just negative peer pressure. Peer pressure can be positive. You know, uh, I remember in school, or I remember at home, you know, if, uh, if, if my parents would tell us, if you all act right, you know, you'll be able to, we'll make some popcorn tonight. 
after supper. We'll make some popcorn. Well, what if, what if you're behaving and your brothers and sisters are misbehaving, you know, and you want that popcorn? You know, what are you going to do? Well, wouldn't you tell your brothers and sisters, hey, you all need to chill out, man. I want some popcorn, you know? That's called positive peer pressure, right? You're not forcing them to do anything, but you're at least reminding them that, hey, you know, mom and dad said that we can have a reward if we all act right. Okay, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's called positive peer pressure, and you should do that. If someone in your class is doing something that's not that's breaking the rules, you know, that's going to affect the teacher's attitude that day. So you should be able, you should say something to your fellow students and say, hey, you know, you know, we're going to lose out on, you know, whatever reward we might get today if you continue to do that. Can you, can you stop doing that? Let's make the teacher's day a pleasant day, right? Okay, so I told you tonight's kind of a special uh, uh, presentation. It's uh, uh, since we're having our one day event, we're still in, it's actually still in full swing. Um, it doesn't end till what, 6.45? So at this time, I have a special guest speaker. And uh, I'm going to get out of this chair, and I'm going to turn this class over to Chris Heiler. If everybody would stand. Welcome, everybody, in the auditorium. Please be seated. And of course, also with all of you watching online that joined us, I know I've gotten many messages from all, all around the world today. And of course, this right here is truly where everything begins. At uh, Taking these classes, going through these classes, and building one block upon another, and establishing this character, building this character within ourselves, and then of course, rippling outwardly. And as William was covering there in procedure two, um, there was two questions there, turning back to LP4C, and notice when it tells you to ask the students, you're just asking them to see what they've retained. Uh, there on LP4C, it's how would you define the word society? Well, as a teacher, you should remember that in Chapter 5 of the Character Unit, you went over that in detail. And you defined what society was. And, of course, that's also where it talks about the ripple effect. But that's just to call back to your memory and for you to put down for your notes. And also, B, what is culture and how does it relate to society? Well, in the acceptance unit on page 13, really in chapter 1, but on page 13 specifically, we covered about culture and, of course, what it means to be accepting of others. doesn't mean you accept negative things, but you accept things, as William was talking about, about people as they make decisions. They might be a little bit differently from one country to the next, but it doesn't bring harm to yourself, someone else, or the environment. Therefore, there's nothing wrong with it. What one person may do, you know, where we may drink uh, coffee with, tea, with uh, milk in the UK, they drink tea with milk. Now, to me, that's a little bit strange, but to them, we're a little bit strange, you know, but we're not really strange, we're unique. We're unique individuals. Looking over to page 85, of course, William read the top there, starting out with chapter 4, uh, Respect and Society. And it says, and think about this, if we lived in a society where everyone was respectful of others, their belongings, problems such as physical and verbal abuse, as well as crime that involved theft and murder would cease or can cease to exist, would cease to exist. Now think about that when you look into society and you have the ever search for the cure for cancer. How to end heart disease. What if we found out that to, to end murder, rape, theft, all of these horrific crimes just revolved around educating society in a better way and removing the education that we put into society that is causing the breakage. You know, our, our event today was discussing about how there's no gap, generation gap, uh, when teaching peace, uh, character education or having peace into your life. The gap that exists in society is truly created by society. It's very difficult to train a child in a one-hour class and cover a couple pages, go through explanations, give examples, and then they return home and play video games for six, seven, eight endless hours of violence. And they do that every night. But they only get in one or two hours a week of what we say, well, you know, even if it's the peaceful solution. 
Of course, if it's a peaceful solution and they're paying attention, eventually those video games will leave. I've seen students, I've seen young men in other countries actually bring their video games to their parents and tell them, you know, this is not beneficial to me. This is not helping me. But these are things that we have to realize that if we want to go in the right direction, we have to continue in the right direction. There's no going forward and turn around and taking five steps back. You know, if your house is green and you want to paint it blue, when you start painting it blue, you don't pick up a can of green and start painting the green on it again and thinking, well, it'll turn blue eventually. You, you have to continue and see it through and you, to complete your goal. Well, there are answers and it can come through education. That's a proven fact. If you want to make a change in your life, it can only come through education. And that's what the author of The Peaceful Solution has said for many years. Peace can only come through education. And the only way that it will not work in our lives is if we choose not to use it. It's a choice that we have to make. It's not an easy choice. We might not get to do the things that we once liked to do, but when we stand back and think, well, I like to do that, but it sure brought me a lot of problems, brought me a lot of heartache. Well, if you like hitting your finger with a hammer, then you'll continue to hit your finger with a hammer. But if you finally want to stop the pain in your finger, eventually you have to quit hitting your finger with the hammer. Doesn't mean you gotta throw the hammer away. You just gotta become more efficient at using it. You know, and that's, that's what we really see in society. Those are analogies that sometimes they see simplistic, but sometimes fixing the greatest problems, the answers are very simplistic. Continuing on, it says, think about it. A world where no one disrespects others and everyone interacts with concern and consideration for the next person. Impossible, you say? Well, not if everyone starts to develop a positive moral character. Think about not just on a societal level in a community scale, just think about watching the world news every night. This country bombing this country, this country wanting this country's oil, this country sanctioning this country, this country doing this, this country doing that. And when we think about things, you know, when you, when you think about the United States sanctions Russia, China sanctions the United States, um, the United States and Britain sanction Venezuela. We, we hear countries and we think about countries. We kind of lose the concept of all of the people that live in those countries that are going to suffer for it. You know, and Americans, we kind of get spoiled to the fact that when China puts tariffs on the United States, we just have to pay a little bit more money. When OPEC cuts the oil, you know, which is one form of trying to govern the system, we just have to pay a little bit more for gas. But there's some countries when they're sanctioned, paying a little bit more is not an option, and eventually there becomes nothing. And it's really like twisting the arm or hurting the people of that country to try to get them to comply. Well, if you're causing someone pain to get them to comply with what you want, would you define that as respectful or disrespectful? Yeah. Then have your students think about these things. Have them truly consider what they're seeing. We've had hundreds of wars. Not one has ever brought peace not one. If they brought peace, we wouldn't have another war. But another day brings another war. But continuing on here in the second chapter, it says in chapter one, you learned that all people deserve respect and even complete strangers can demonstrate concern by treating each other with compassion. So that's important. Everyone deserves respect. There is no, you have to earn it, there are things that have to be earned. Trust is something that has to be earned. You know, that's something that's built over a period of time. When you build a trusted friendship, you get to know someone, you know you can interact with them sometimes. You know, think about it. If you were wanting to invest money into starting a business, would you want to get to know someone who you trusted with your investment? Or would you just go find somebody off the street and go, hey, I'd like to invest $100,000 in you. I would dare say most people would go, I think you should. Absolutely. You know, now I can't guarantee the business will succeed now. It might be a total loss. But you want to deal with people you trust. And it's if you have children and you take them for someone to take care of or to watch over, you want it to be someone you can trust. But we have to return that same kind of character trait back into society, the things we want. 
the things we want to see that's beneficial, the things that we want to benefit from ourselves, we have to reciprocate that back into society itself with our own conduct. But continuing on, it says, did you know that when each individual makes the choice to interact with respect, there is a positive effect on our society? It actually is a benefit, you know, and, and that's a question. You want to ask them that because you really want to see what they say. And when someone, you know, you'll get someone go, I don't see it. And if someone, you know, people really don't like the law of theft, you know, and that's a law in the United States. You're not supposed to steal. Some people don't worry about that law until someone steals something that belongs to them that's really important. And then, man, they're ready to turn everything upside down. The whole community needs to come out and look. You know, I see that a lot in some countries, and I don't mean to downplay this in any way. But when a child disappears, it's only important to the people that know the child and people that have experienced what takes place. And I say that not that other people don't care. We get Amber Alerts here in the United States all the time. But when you get an Amber Alert on your phone, what do you honestly do? You pick it up, you look, you see the city that it took place in, you clear it out, you put your phone back down. And everybody's phone's going off. Now, if you picked it over, or you picked it up and you looked over and you've seen the name of someone, if you've seen the name of someone you knew, or if it was your child that was on that Amber Alert, you would look at it very differently. You know, and, and I've seen other countries where people, their children go missing quite often. And they'll put posts on Facebook, they'll, they'll post on Twitter, you know, Instagram, they'll get on every social media they can, and I don't blame them to f try to find their child. Sometimes they'll leave out of anger, arguments at home, but they just leave. They don't realize what they're stepping into when they leave home. They don't realize they're stepping into a bay of piranhas. And people will search, and sadly, I would say 50% of the time of what I've seen, they turn up as a body laying somewhere. They don't come back home. But the parents will search hard, a lot of regret taking place, and they're wanting everybody to join in. Well, obviously, everybody's not going to join in because someone hurt the child. They wouldn't join in to look. They're too busy looking for the next child now. They've moved along. But these are the sad things in society we can put an end to. But pose this question to your students and get feedback from them. Continuing on, it says, this can occur because we are interdependent with others. We need each other. We depend on each other. We're entwined with each other, so to speak. In other words, we rely on each other as we interact, communicate, and go about our daily lives. How do we measure whether we live in a society that values and promotes respectful conduct and interaction? Well, first you go back and remind yourself what are values. These are things that you deem to be important. Remember, that's, chat, that's page six of the character unit, where we went into what values are. And we're going to learn as we progress even further that five people can have a list of ten different things. Give everybody a list of ten things and let five people evaluate them from one to ten on importance that they have. And that could be five different lists that show up, you know. One might be number one on one person's list, might be three on another. One on one person's list might be eight on another. That's not necessarily wrong. But if you start putting things like life, human life on the list, that should be very high on everyone's list. Very high. But I, I, I give you an example. If you were to put human life, father, neighbor, citizen in the next country, well, how are people going to label that? People are going to, of course, human life, and the people they know are going to be more important. Citizens in other countries will be important too, but not as important as mom, dad, brother, sister, and uncle. And that's how the value system works in our own lives. But we have to learn, we have to educate ourselves to realize the person we don't know, the person we've never met, the person who we might see on the TV in another country are just as important as a person sitting in front of us in our house that we love and would want to give our life for. Everybody has that same value. And it must be interpreted that way or else we start devaluing human life. 
Continuing on, it says, how do we measure whether we live in a society that values and promotes respect, respectful conduct and interaction? Of course, that's the question that's posed. How do we do that? This perception is a lie. What behavior does our society consider as disrespectful? Once again, you're posing questions to the students. You're trying to get them to think. You're trying to get those wills to turn in their mind. And you're really wanting them to pull off what we went over with how to respect each other, how to respect ourselves, and how everybody deserves respect. All of the things that we've covered so far, and even going back into the self-control unit, the acceptance unit, and the character unit. So they have a lot of knowledge to pull from, and that's what you're really looking for, is to see how much they've retained, how much they're holding on, and how much this is becoming a part of their life. When the peaceful solution becomes a part of your life, it becomes a part of your heart and mind. And it shows through your speech. It shows through your conduct. It shows through your everyday life where you interact with others. You know, you become a person of integrity, as the character unit says. Finishing up here on page 85, it says, In this chapter, you will explore the answers to these questions, and you will learn how a lack of respect can affect our society. You know, and by the time they're at the end of this, they'll find out it's not can Effect, it's how it will affect our society. So continuing on with our theme of the one day event that we've had much success for and have really enjoyed, I'm gonna turn it over to the next guest speaker. And for everyone to please stand and welcome David Knighton. Hi, it's great to see everybody here. Go ahead and have a seat if you're standing. Um, so we'd like to welcome everybody here for, uh, that's online and also at the headquarters here. And we're going to be turning over to Lesson Plan 4, page D. Lesson Plan 4, page D. Chris finished out uh, page 85, which was the last page that was listed on um, uh, Procedure 2. Now, this is a guide, of course. We're learning to be teachers. And so this is a guide for you to have a very organized class and the lesson is set out for you. It's very easy to follow. And, um, and, and then you can explain and expound upon these things. So it starts out and says, tell students that attitudes, and get that word attitudes. Attitude is so very important. Attitude is not something you change in one day. Attitude is something that has to grow. Um, attitude is something that that your values uh, have a, a huge effect on. You, you've got to value things and, and, and your beliefs and your, your customs and everything within you creates a basic attitude. Your beliefs, your customs regarding morality, food, get that, food, entertainment. Yes, there is food that is not great for you to eat. Uh, there are things that you eat that people call food sometimes. It's really not food. Um, entertainment. And being entertained is just basically uh, sitting there doing nothing, not achieving anything. And, and that's what it's designed for, basically. And clothing are only some of the ways that one culture can differ from the next. You know, you have one society or one culture that has, uh, that, that cherishes and values modest clothing. Then you might have another society and uh, another culture that um, some of the island communities or something that might not uh, really uh, care much about the modest clothing. So, so you have different things going on here. It says, have students read the section entitled Understanding Society and Culture on pages 86 and 87 in our handbooks. Now, uh, I'd like to mention one thing. When, when Chris was talking about, I mean, you know, when it says tell students the attitudes, beliefs, and customs, uh, all these things are some of the ways that one culture can differ from the next. And one of the things he said in paragraph 2 on page 85 was that, did you know when each individual makes the choice to interact with respect? And that's a key thing right there, making the choice. You have to choose to do the right thing, but you have to know what the right thing is. Again, the different cultures and societies and religions and so forth all have different ideas on what might be uh, proper or not. And so we have to know what that is. And of course, a, a proper choice in any of these things is a choice that doesn't hurt yourself, that doesn't hurt others or property in the environment. This is what we want to guide ourselves to. This is what we want to always have the attitude of, okay? So let's turn on over to page 86 in our handbooks. 
And on page 86, and of course, this is in the respect manual, understanding society and culture, understanding what that is. What's the difference here? So in general, the word society refers to a community or broad group of people who work together for a common purpose and have collective activities and interests. Okay, that's a mouthful. Let's look at it one more time. So society, it refers to a community, a broad group of people that work together for a common purpose and have collective activities and interests. So they have some things in common, okay? The common purpose of a society, whether small, large, simple, or complex, is to function for the survival and benefit of all its members. Stop right there and think about it for just a minute. In any community, if I went to a large city, I'm here in Texas, and if I went to a large city, I would expect to be able to, you know, get a haircut. I would expect to be able to go to the dentist if I needed to. I would expect to be able to uh, go to the store and purchase whatever belongings I needed, whether it be clothing or, or tools or what have you. I would probably want to be able to know that I live in a place where I could buy a car if necessary, if I wanted to get around, or some form of transportation. I would want to know that there was somebody that could either sell me or rent me a house, you know, have some shelter. I, I, would, I would really like a place to where, you know, me not being a plumber or an electrician, I would like to be in a place where I could call somebody if I had a problem. I could call the plumber and say, hey, I've got a real problem here. I can't deal with it. Can you come help, you know? And also with the electrician and you name it, on and on and on. If I wanted to build something, maybe build a garage and I didn't know how to do it, I could call a carpenter and get some help out there, then call the insulator, then call, you know, on and on, painting, whatever. Just name it. Everything would need to be available to us. And, and, and interestingly enough, I would expect that same thing if I moved to a small town. Wouldn't you? We live in, uh, I live in a small community here in Texas, and in this small community, we actually have everything that you could need along those lines. You know, we have, uh, you could get a haircut, you could, you could uh, buy clothing and food and, uh, you know, a restaurant, uh, uh, on and on. All these things are available. And so, so to make a community, it's like it says here. Um, it is to function, the common purpose of a society, whether small, large, simple, or complex, is to function for the survival, survival and benefit of all its members. More can be accomplished when people work together and share their talents and skills. Now, an interesting thing about the community that I live in is that the people that I know here, and I know just about everybody, it's a very small community at this time, but I know that we all work together and share common goals in that we don't want to hurt anybody else. We don't want to hurt them physically or mentally. There is no thought of having a war with the guy that lives down the street and breaking out the firearms and knives and everything and going to town. Uh, there, there just is none of that. So we have this collective and and we do work together, and we all share our talents and skills. So we have all those physical things we need, and we also have the things that, that are deeper than that. We have the same values, and, and when everyone's working together with the same values, you can really create something, something beneficial, something morally acceptable. And then that can go out to other communities that are nearby, and then on and on and on. So when you consider these things, you know, people look at where they want to live. <clears throat> when someone's moving somewhere, whether it be because of a job or what have you, they find out a little bit about different areas, and they, they find out, well, I want to live in this part of town right here because it has all the things I need. Well, I want to live in this part of town right here because I don't have a car and I don't want a car. I want to be able to walk to work. Or, you know, so they find out these things, and then they make decisions based upon that. Well, if you walk to work and you find out the area of town you were thinking about is dangerous because everybody doesn't share your same values, you're probably going to choose to do something different as far as choosing where you live. And remember, the, all these choices matter. Let's move along here to the second paragraph on page 86. So have you considered, have you, 
Have you considered, let's do it if you haven't, how much you rely on others in society to help meet your basic needs? All right, so you might decide to yourself, you know, hey, I don't need a barber anyway. Who cares if there's a barber? I cut my own hair, okay? I don't need any, anybody cooking my food. I can cook my own food. You know, I don't even need anybody to give me a ride anywhere. I've got a bike, I've got a car, I can walk, whatever. So you, you may have certain things that you're very skilled at and talented at, and by choice you decide you don't need those certain things. On the other hand, another person might come to that same community and decide they need those things. Maybe somebody doesn't know how to cut their own hair. As simple as it sounds, it's not so simple sometimes. Um, so we we have to think about these and we have to consider these things and we have to consider that we do rely on others none of us can make it on our own it just doesn't work that way if you got put on a deserted island or or out in the middle of the desert even if you had what you needed at the time for some shelter and some food for a little while you're going to find yourself needing to rely on somebody You'll go stark raving mad not having any communication with another human being. So we do rely on others. All right, for example, unless you or your parents make all of your clothes, grow all your food, raise your own chickens and cows, you know, you've got to rely on the clothing and food industry to supply you with the necessary items. So see what we're talking about here? If you've never considered that, it's time to really look at it. Uh, you know, some of some of the folks I see here at the headquarters do actually live in the same community I live in, and they know what I'm talking about. It's great to know that you can go and get those things that that you consider valuable and you consider important, and that everybody else in that community considers it the same way. Have you ever considered who built the roads you walk and drive on daily or the school that you attend? So here we go again. Well, so you, you know how to cut your own hair and you know how to fix your pipes and stuff, but do you know how to build a road? I mean, maybe you do, maybe you don't, but I guarantee you don't know how to do everything that you're going to need at some point in life. Have you ever considered who built the roads you walk and drive on daily or the school that you attend? Who makes the products you use on a daily basis, and how do they arrive at stores for you to purchase and use? Now, if you had to do all of those things, you would be so busy just trying to keep things coming in and going out, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have time to cut your hair or fix your pipes or fix your car or cook your food or any of that stuff. Uh, so a lot of times we don't consider what all goes into keeping a community together and operating and running smoothly. I know the author of The Peaceful Solution said, you know, it, it's a tough thing keeping a community going, making sure everything runs smooth and everything clicks and, and connects at just the right point, you know. Um, so it can be very easy to take for granted the benefits of living within a society because we can be become accustomed to having these products and services ready, readily available to us. Now, that's true. You, you, you can easily take these things for granted. And remember the old adage that says you don't know what you have until it's gone. You don't know what you had until it's gone, right? So I know some men that I've dealt with in prison, and they didn't know what they had until it was gone. Yeah, they had shelter over their head. Yeah, they had clothing. They had food. Um, but there were other things that they had that were taken away from them. They could no longer move freely wherever they wanted to go. They could no longer partake of simple pleasures like uh, uh, driving the car to uh, you know to wherever you wanted to drive it to. Maybe you wanted to to uh, uh, go see a mountain range or something. Just an example, but but to have the ability to jump in the car and go. Or, or other types of transportation, you're locked within a certain area, you're confined within even a smaller area at certain times of day, you can't just have the freedom to do all the things that you would like to do. So you don't know what you have until it's taken away. And that's how it is when we take for granted the benefits of living within a society and a community that we all work together and have the same values. That's so extremely important and wonderful when you experience it. 
Um, another important point that culture is derived from society, another important point is that culture is derived from society. And so uh, culture includes a shared set of attitudes, the values, the goals, and the practices that distinguishes one group of people from another. And so these things interact, the society, the culture, they interact completely. And in other words, culture is what makes one society different from another. Now, um, I think right there might be a great place to stop and introduce our next speaker, our next guest speaker. And so if you all please stand, it's my great opportunity to introduce to you um, Katan Alexander. Thank you. Okay, welcome everyone. Please be seated. Thank you, David. Again, I hope everyone's had a wonderful day here at the uh, spring seminar, uh, spring conference, I guess I should say, as we uh, continue to move forward here with our normal class that we have on uh, Sundays and, and Wednesdays. Um, we are continuing in the respect unit, and we are on chapter four, in case you're joining us just for the first time, <coughs> or just now joining us, we're on page 86. And I'm just going to be picking up where David left off because he was talking about um, uh, society and he got into a little bit about culture. And while he was talking about it, I was thinking about uh, the comparison of society and the many different components of society that we really don't even think about, uh, generally speaking. You know, we go out, we get on the road, you know, we get in our cars and then we drive on the road from point A to point B. You know, we don't take into consideration all that goes into uh, making that road available. Uh, we don't always stop and think about the fact that, no, it's not just the, the men or the crews, the construction company that, that laid out the asphalt and rolled it out. I mean, there was a lot of work that came before that with the mining of the materials that got into it, the manufacturing of the, the, the tar mix that goes into the asphalt or the, or the batching plant that made the concrete or, or the place that made the rebar, you know, or, or the place that formed the, the, the trusses or whatever it is for the bridges that you drive over. And, and you know, there's so many different aspects you know, within our society, so many different components that we don't think about. And like, like uh, David was saying, it could be very, very easy to take for granted. But I was thinking about how society can be compared to our own bodies, right? You know, we have our bodies and there are many different functions of our bodies. And when everything is functioning properly, we're able to do what requests we put into it. So let's just say, you know, how we interact with the society, our brains interact with our body. That's our consciousness. We kind of know what's going on. We know if we want to pick up a glass of water and drink it, we just think it, and then we pick up a glass of water and, and, and drink it. Well, when something is not functioning properly, if a signal is not getting from the brain to the muscle that controls the arm and the fingers, you can look at that glass of water all day, but you're not going to be able to pick it up and drink it. Well, it's the same thing with the, within society. When there is one member within society that is not doing their job or that is not doing their job as they're instructed to, it could cause problems. And this is a part of what we're going to get into. But first, we have to lay the foundation of understanding what a society is and what a culture is, because, you know, this is commonplace everywhere we go. You know, even, you know, I think about uh, gr I grew up in Ohio and we had in um um, it's a little bit south of Cleveland. Uh, we had a large um, um, uh, Amish society, right? And they valued certain things. They worked towards certain things. And in fact, people would travel to the Amish communities to get certain things that were hand built by them because they had a reputation for doing things, uh, you know, very sturdy, very strong. You know, they, they didn't really use a lot of power tools and so forth, you know. But they, they upheld certain standards within their community. They did things to guard and protect certain values within their community. And these are the things that we look for uh, when, we, when we consider what a society is. And then culture is much the same thing. In fact, David got started on that and, um, at the very bottom there, that last paragraph, and he read there saying another important point is that culture is derived from society. Now, when you think about that word derived there, it simply means coming from 
or caused by something else. So culture is actually coming from this, these, uh, this broad group or community of people who work together for a common purpose and have collective activities and interests. And, and out of those many different societies, you can actually form many different cultures or many different cultures have been formed. Now, even within our, um, even within the, the great United States of America, right? And in certain areas, they, they consider, um, well, not just certain areas, but the United States as a whole, when I was growing up in social studies and so forth, learning about the United States of America, it was uh, known as the social melting pot, the cultural melting pot of the world, because a lot of different cultures and diversities you know, they, they, you know, everybody wanted, that was their goal, to get to the United States, to see the Statue of Liberty, to uh, be able to experience many of the freedoms and many of the, the uh, economic and social opportunities that they might not have experienced within their own countries and, and even within their own cultures. I mean, there are many cultures that don't allow certain or many of the freedoms that we have in the United States. Okay, and so, so people's goals was to get here, but even within the United States, you have many different cultures within a society. And you can consider the United States as a whole, as a society, okay? And for the most part, you know, generally speaking, generally speaking, now you've got your, your Democrats and your Republicans, your right wings, your left wings, your, your beaks, your feet, your tail feathers, you know, all parts of the birds in there. Uh, but generally speaking, generally, you know, we have, for the most part, the same goals, right? We want the best for our, our country. We want the best for our families. We want the best for, you know, opportunities for our future generations that grow up, or even people who do come here, you know, to the United States, taking into consideration that, you know, you know many of our ancestors weren't weren't born and raised here, they came here from other places. And so we work towards that common goal. And, and, uh, and we try to protect against things that would um, stifle the, uh, the progression of those values coming, taking place or taking shape. So you've got many cultures there. It says another important uh, point is that culture is derived from society. And like David said, their culture includes a shared set of attitudes, values, goals, and practices that distinguishes one group of people from another. In other words, culture is what makes one society different from another. Uh, there can be several different cultures within a society. And even, uh, even growing up in, in Cleveland, now I was not like, like New York. I've been to New York a few times and I know several people uh, here that lived in New York for a long period of time, there is a very, very diverse culture of people in New York. There was a very, very uh, diverse cultures uh, in, in Cleveland, where I grew up as well. Um, and, and in those different societies, those li little cultures, those little societies within the, the state of Ohio, you had, you know, people where, who collectively lived together who were, you know, might be uh, Israelis or uh, Pakistanis or uh, Iran Iranians or people from Africa or, or you know, uh, people from Puerto Rico and, and things of that nature. You had different groups that kind of huddled together within their own little society and, and they were able to express and, and um, freely live their culture because it was common to everybody, right? And so there can be many different cultures within society. And the United States, for example, is one country with many cultures. Many of the immigrants who came to this country maintain their cultural practices from the countries of their birth and have enriched the lives of others by sharing those practices. And one thing that I appreciate is, of course, learning. I appreciate learning about different cultures. And we really should get to know people. You know, as we learn in the acceptance unit, uh, you know, we should get to know other people, get to know other cultures, learn about the differences that we have. There's nothing wrong with, with certain differences. It, it, does, it just means that they're not like us. 
It doesn't mean that it's necessarily bad, but they're things that we can learn. You know, sometimes you can uh, learn and develop skills about, um, you know, farming practices, uh, taking care of animals, uh, the manufacturing of certain textiles and things of that nature. And some, some cultures are highly known for certain of their skills like textiles and leathers and, and certain foods and rices that are produced and things of that nature, uh, you know, um, uh, just just things in general, you know, electronics and things of that nature. Um, so, but the more we educate ourselves, the more diverse we become in our understanding of these different cultures. You know, one of the things I appreciate, and we're getting ready to cover here a little bit, you know, you think I haven't eaten, I did already, but uh, food. You know, I, I enjoy um, not just hearing about or watching on the Food Network or something like that. I enjoy learning about, understanding the benefit of, and tasting, sampling certain foods, different foods from different cultures. You know, now I'm not like the one guy who, you know, goes to all different countries and, and he'll pretty much eat anything that's set in front of him, whether it's squirrels or, you know, squid or, you know, worms or caterpillars or whatever, you know. Uh, I do have a standard of what I, I put in my body and we should too. We should educate ourselves and understand the things that like, um, uh, you know, the previous teacher says, you know, we should understand that there are foods that are beneficial for us and there are foods that are not beneficial for us. We can't displace or separate understanding and learning about different cultures from the very first positive character trait we learned about in the character unit, which is becoming educated. Because just because someone sets it in front of you, you know, is it better to offend somebody by not saying no, you know, uh, or, or, or by, um, uh, yeah, by not saying no, or is it better to protect your health? right? Uh, because your health is going to be with you and stick with you for a very long time and you want it to be optimal. But, you know, learning about how people prepare foods. And, you know, one of the things I've learned is that a lot of people in different cultures, places that um, they kind of have really stuck to their, their, their heritage, their roots, uh, you know, when they make foods, they don't just, like here in America, we just eat it because it's delicious. You know, we saw that big juicy advertisement of a hamburger on that commercial, you know, so we want to drive by and we want to go get us one and a nice tall, you know, 82 ounce Coca-Cola and, you know, a, a half a pound of fries or whatever, you know. A lot of times the, the, the places, many cultures, they prepare foods based on their nutritional benefits, right? Uh, some, <clears throat> sometimes if, a, you know, if a woman is pregnant, you know, some of the women will prepare certain foods that will aid in the um, gestation of the child, that will bring extra health to the mother. Uh, people who might have certain uh, health-related uh, issues, uh, they'll have a diet custom-tailored to that, you know, to help them to recover and to strengthen those areas of the body so that when they eat, they're getting their, they're getting their nutritional benefits, their medicines, actually from their foods, right? They're not relying on going and, and popping a pill. You know, I mean, you, know, you figure, you know, a thousand or so years ago, well, probably not that long, but, but at least, you know, for the most part, people were getting their medicines, their, their healings were actually coming from the foods, the things that grew naturally in the ground. And even many of the medications today um, that are on the market have been synthesized in other words, they've taken the main components from a natural component and they've synthesized them, they've copied them where they can make them in the lab and then sell them for a lot of money. Because a lot of these things that we, that we have can, for the most part, not everything, they're, you know, temperature dependent and so forth. Uh, you can find them, a lot of them, in your backyard, you know, or somebody's backyard. You don't go tromping through somebody's backyard. But, but there's a lot that we can learn when we just get to know people, get to learn a little bit more about the different cultures uh, within our society. So let's look at that paragraph here as we wrap it up. It says, food is how, food and how it is prepared is one example of culture retained by shared and shared by others. Food can distinguish one group of people from another. For example, hamburgers and hot dogs are associated with the American culture. Even after moving to a different nation, People from various cultures will continue using some of the same recipes to prepare food as they did before migrating. Even just traveling, you know, if you get a hold of some of the native foods that you might not be used to, you'll find yourself reverting back to your traditional foods. 
Pizza, for instance, is a food that is popular in America, but it is a part of the Italian culture. Pizza and other Italian foods have become a typical part of the American diet because Italians immigrated, retained, and sorry, Italian immigrants retained and shared their culture of food preparation. And so, you know, you'll see these different things as we learn more about uh, culture. And remember, you know, uh, just because it's different from us doesn't mean it's bad. We're going to get into understanding the thing that really separates great from bad, and that is mor morality or the rules, the keeping and breaking of those rules. And if those traditions or customs or beliefs, share beliefs, bring harm to ourselves, other and in, in the environment, or if they bring a benefit. But for today, we're going to go ahead and conclude this class. We're going to stop there um, on, uh, I just lost my page, page 87, and we'll pick up on page 88 in the next class, and uh, that actually will be me. Uh, and just for your, for your calendar, mark your calendar, our next class is actually going to be uh, this coming uh, Sunday, not, not Wednesday, we're going to, uh, we have uh, some things that are be taking place Wednesday, but it's going to be this coming Sunday, the uh, 16th. Is that right? Yeah, yeah the 16th. It's going to be the the, uh, the upcoming 16th, 4-16, 5-30 Central Standard Time, as we normally have it. We thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you at the next class. Have a wonderful evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. <laughs>